Hi, everybody. Cynthia Allen here with the Never Stop Artistry of Self-Care and Creativity for Lifelong Embodied Performance. This is the Feldenkrais Awareness Summit. And I have with me today Norma Lystico. And uh, I'll have to ask her about the uh, derivation of her name because I find that to be uh, uh, interesting, interesting, Lice Deco. Yes. So let me tell you a little bit about Norma. She has an extensive education and experience in both theater and dance. She has BA and MA degrees. She attended the uh, school, uh, the Dred Williams School of Ballet in Portland, and she studied with Anna Halperin. She studied with Moshe Feldenkrais. She's performed in live theater and has been an extra in films for over 30 years, has worked as a dance therapist for adults in lockup wards and taught and performed with Anna Halperin for 25 years. Um, she has taught Feldenkrais Awareness through movement lessons at Duke University Summit Dance Festival, as well as many creative and improvisational workshops in Europe and America. Welcome, Norma. Thank you. It's good to have you here. It's good to have you here. Of course, we lost an incredible person this last year in the world of dance and movement, uh, Anna Halperin. And it's not that many people that we could explore that has actually studied with both Moshe and Anna. I think you graduated from his first American training. Yes, 1977 is the official date. We started in 1975 and went 10 weeks every summer, 75, 76, 77. Wow, okay. And then you, did you start with Anna sometime later than that then? Or was Moshe about the same time or? No, um, I'm, I'm, I had already been studying with Anna and dancing in her little dance troupe. We did a lot of performing arts, which is where I started with Anna. I had, um, I, in college, I wanted to be uh, in theater arts, any kind of theater arts. So someone told me when I was graduating from college, you know, you're, you're going to California, because I was, I was going to San Francisco. And she said, you've got to look up this woman named Anna Halprin. And I'd never heard of her. I didn't know anything about her. And I did look her up and, um, and found that she was doing some wonderful um, theater work. Uh, you know, those were the days where they were, they were still doing um, um, like makeshift arts on the street. You'd make up a score and then you do it. And you do it between 10 in the morning and 12 noon. And three of you were doing it out on the Fillmore bus system. And two of you were doing the same dance, walking down the parkway. So we had all these events going on all the time. So I was really interested in the way she entered into the arts. Mm -hmm. And that's how I met, that's really how I met Anna is through someone who told me about it and they were a dancer visiting Portland, Oregon, where that's where I was finishing college. Mm -hmm. And okay. so, so yeah. I saw, yeah, let's, let's, I think you wanted to start, let's, let me take us on the, the little slideshow that we have put together about Moshe, because I think you wanted to go a little over Moshe and your background with him. And then we're going to go on and you're going to really take us on a journey with Anna as well. Does that sound okay. good? Okay. Yeah. Okay, Moshe, wonderful. His martial arts, way before I knew him, <laughs> but way after he had studied martial arts in France. And this was, you know, he was, this looks like the time when he was already in Israel. He went to Israel after the Second World War. I just love these shots because. Um, it, it gave you a, he gave this wonderful feeling of how much he, uh, he could move his body around. So I was very impressed seeing these photographs. Mm -hmm. Lovely guy, huh? Handsome fellow. 
I think that's a handsome shot of him. Now here he is exactly during our training, he would demonstrate various points on the skeleton. He always had a skeleton there. I think he was talking about something to do with the spine and its connection with the scapula. And this is the way he always dressed by the time I actually was in training with him. He wore the shirt outside the pants. You know, it was a time when people wore shirts inside their pants. So he wore it outside and he had that, uh, that kind of hairdo that um, he had for the rest of his life. And this is Margaret Mead, who, who gave, who was a, wanted to visit um, Moshe and had known him and about his work for quite a long time. So she, and the, and the guy in the middle is Carl Prebram, who had a primate lab, and I'm pretty sure it was in Florida. And he also wanted to visit, and they managed to get together on the, at the same time. And um, Margaret, Margaret Mead talked about how the children in New Guinea learned how to walk, is that the, their culture didn't want the children to walk on the ground. They thought it would make them too animal-like. I thought that was an interesting story. And Carl Pribram talked a lot about the primates' ability to learn. But both their lectures was, they were just fascinating. And they just came in and started talking one day. We didn't even know they were going to be guests until the last minute. So, and here's a picture in our classroom. It was at the University of San Francisco. This was a classroom on the second floor of the regular University of San Francisco building. And eventually we moved to a large, the second summer, we moved to a larger place. And this is a nice shot, but it, it kind of shows whenever he would start talking or lecturing, he would say something and he'd say, you, you do this movement. So we might be in the middle of a group class, which we were in this. And then he'd say, well, look at this point of view, you know, how you turn your, in this picture, you see someone has their palm turned down at the same time, they've got their fingers pointed a certain direction. And he would make a big point. He said, and why is that? Why is that? He kept asking his questions. I like that. So these are all the people in my class. There's Mia in the background and let's see uh, there were a couple canadian ladies i don't remember their name they're in the picture and here is paul rubin who's a trainer now in this feldenkrais guild and he's here with kind of receding hairline he's sitting leaning on his arm so this is lecture this is lecture mode that he would do all the time and lots of people photographed him that way and you know there he is with jerry Carzan, who was also i was in we were in the same training class and moshe is talking about functional integration which is the technique moshe developed before he developed group classes he did just one-on-one. -on -one. He would move people around very gently and slowly. He had lots of children, lots of various people um, taking his one-on-one -on -one lessons. So we got a chance to look sometimes, but usually it happened at the end of our teaching day, the day he taught us, then he'd start working with people. Sometimes he'd do it at the lunch hour, but usually there wasn't enough time. And this is Frank Wildman, who was a trainer. He now does a different kind of body movement. And I believe that that person in the background is uh, Roger Russell, who now works constantly as a Feldenkrais practitioner in uh, Europe. He's very active there. 
And Moshe is again demonstrating an individual movement, moving the head to move the spine, to move through the leg that is the favored leg. So he would often demonstrate if you, you can see that this is his favorite leg, because when I push on his head, all the weight goes toward that one leg. So it was very, very nice um, demonstrations he gave. We did not do a lot of individual work in our first summer. There's Mia who was, uh, I think his main assistant. She was there for all of our trainings. But she is the one who encouraged Moshe before he started teaching in America to go to Japan. And Mia and her husband had gone to Japan to certain to study certain arts. And, and, Mar and Mia was a martial artist already, too. Thanks, IFF. Yes, thank you, IFF, for collecting the pictures. Yeah, so... Um... I think you wanted to just kind of take us on a little bit of a journey now, and you'll let me know when we want you want us to look at the slides of Anna. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's good. Well, I just want to say briefly about how I met both of them just really briefly. And I just want to say that I didn't know who Moshe was, even though I had lived on a kibbutz farm in Israel all of 1970 and 71, but I never heard of Moshe there. And although he was functioning, if I had known that he was teaching there, it would have been interesting, but I didn't know anything about him at that time. But when I came back from Israel, um, Anna, whom I had already met and was already taking classes from and dancing in her dance group, uh, she said, oh, yeah, I know Moshe. So she had known him quite well because she went to Israel almost every year and her husband, too. He did quite a bit of uh, architecture on the old city of Jerusalem and so forth. He did a lot for that. So that's just how I met both of them. Um, I met Anna because I had met someone who knew dancers in San Francisco and I was just leaving college. And um, they said, you've got to go study with this woman. She's really wonderful. And I had majored in theater arts in college. So I was eager to be with someone, not so much dance as theater arts. And that's what Anna was doing. Okay, so um, what, you're going to show some pictures now of Anna really quickly. Yeah, let's just do that because then I want to talk a little bit about the differences and the similarities between, I perceive between Anna and uh, Moshe. Okay, so this is Anna's on the far side of the picture, Anna running up the trail. And this is a picture in the, that's okay, that's Anna's daughter who became a teacher and now runs Anna's former institute. And that's a picture of me with a head scarf on. And this is a picture she had, Anna had a, if you haven't ever seen it, it's a fabulous studio her husband built. She had an outdoor dance deck where she did all her teaching, but the winters were cold or cold enough to be uncomfortable. So he built her an indoor studio. It had heating in the floor. It, I never heard of heating in the floor. It was fabulous. And that's Anna kind of in the middle of the picture in the black leotards. And all these people were somebody in her dance class that's me standing up in the corner. And we were all doing a dance improvisation. Anna would direct the improvisations by giving certain parameters. They weren't just uh, do anything you want. She had certain guidelines. 
very specific something. Here she is, and she and her husband gave an outdoor workshop one summer, I think it was three weeks, and all the dancers and all the architect students worked together building some kind of housing or shelter out of all the driftwood on the public beach there. So that was really fun to do. And it's really from this time when her husband got involved with all the architects that she began to have a wider viewpoint of where the dances were performed rather than being in an indoor proscenium stage. They begin to take place in lots of different places. That's her husband. And that's Anna and Anna's famous hat. <laughs> Eating sand, I guess. Beautiful picture of her face and the dancers. And Paul Ryan was there through 1968, through the ceremony of us uh, performance. And these were the teachers uh, at one time. This is about 30 years ago that this shot was taken. Thank you so much for just those, those little pictorial journey there uh, with both of them. And I know, I know that these were two large influences on your life. So let's let you just continue on here. Oh, okay. All right. So after I met them, I just want to say that when I was in college, I went to a ballet studio, not because I wanted to be a dancer, but when you're an actress, you take voice lessons, dance lessons, singing lessons, you know, you do everything so you can get a job, everybody's idea. So at one time, Anna was one of those people and she was in Sing Out Sweet Land. If you look it up in the archives, it was a musical on Broadway. Uh, but after that, and when she got married, she moved west and, they, and, and married her husband and they moved west. So, um, but she had been a traditional dancer, but she got her education. I don't know if you remember these people, but Mabel Todd was one of her teachers and Mabel Todd wrote a book called The Thinking Body. And it's like one of the first books that really talked about the anatomy and the neurology um, of, of a dancer's body. So it was just a great book. And Mabel Todd was someone she, Anna studied with. And <coughs> Mabel Todd was a teacher of someone called Lulu Swigert, who was a, did the same thing, really. Uh, a point of view of knowing about the physiology of the body, but at the same time being involved in the kinesthetic sense. They were both trying to uh, have dancers understand what it was to really feel what you're doing. So this is one of the things both Moshe, excuse me, and Anna had in common they both thought it was really important for you to have the dancer or the actress to have your own experience at the moment. And that was so fabulous that she developed her tech, any kind of technique, what you might call it technique around that idea. And of course, Moshe, the same thing. He's, his awareness through movement his whole idea of doing group lessons was, it was important to get your, be aware of the movement you were doing because your awareness of it is what got it into your brain and enabled you to change or add to your movement habits. The other thing that was very much the same if the dancer would come in class and Anna would give some parameter, we're all going to do a improvisation where you just roll on the floor 
and you only get to stand up three times. I mean, she'd make these things up, of course. So we'd start doing that. And right away, there's always somebody who instead of doing rolling would, would be like ballet dancing with their hands. They were imitative. And whenever you saw that image, I wouldn't say she hated it, but it was the last thing she wanted people to do was to imitate, just as Moshe himself has talked about so many in his lectures and his books, that imitation, if you, that's how people in, the, in different cultures learn by imitating, but it never, it's never the center of you. And I love that about both of them that they thought it was so important that you have your experience of it. So that's the main thing I wanted to say about comparing the two. Um, let's see, there was also, a, there were a lot of visitors, as you saw Margaret Mead and so forth to Moshe, but there were also visitors to visiting Anna's classes and there would be people who would, who would come and they wouldn't know what was happening, but they'd be interested in. One of the people was a psychiatrist named Paul Ekman. Paul was doing his doctorate at Langley Porter. And so his doctorate was all about facial expressions. And he's, he wrote quite a few books. But anyway, his wife was a dancer and she took lessons. Um, she took classes with Anna too. And I think that's how Paul found out. So Paul Ekman was a visitor and he was really an interesting guy. So there's all these people. Now, the one thing I wanna say, and I wrote notes just to be sure I wouldn't forget it is about awareness one of the things that Anna developed about having awareness is once I visited, once I was through with my Feldenkrais training, I went back to Israel for three weeks, stayed with some friends, and I watched Moshe work one-on-one. -on -one. And it, one person she was working with was this little baby. He would not open one eye. It was always closed. And the doctor said it was just fine. They didn't know what to do. So the mother was holding the baby. And what Moshe did is put his hand over the baby's eye, the eye that worked, the good eye, what we'd call the good eye. And the baby would push him away and he put his hand there again. So it was like making another part of the body wake up. And that is what Anna did. She, when I first was studying with her, she'd have us go out for walks with a blindfold on. We'd go out to five acres of woods barefoot. And you had to feel your way because you couldn't take the blindfold. And then sometimes we'd work in night classes where you couldn't see a thing. And the dance would come out of those. That was a very important thing. And again, she had this instinct, uh, this feeling how important it was to develop something that needs awakening, so to speak, although she didn't use that language. So that's what that, I think that was very similar in both of them. They just did it in different ways. The good side. The, un, the developed side, the imitative side, and the other side, the side that's blind. They were both geniuses. <laughs> okay, well, that was, that was beautiful just to hear some of about uh, the similarities. And I don't know if you knew this or, you know, you, you knew that they met, but I don't know if you knew that uh, there was this great interview done by Ross Simone, Simon Amy, and it says where Anna says Moshe Feldenkrais was my best friend. 
he was brilliant. I would check things out with him because I didn't know about the nervous system and that was his specialty. I learned a lot from him. And I'm sure Moshe would have said wonderful things about Anna as well. I think they both came from, uh, I mean, we know, I know Moshe's background uh, from the Ukraine coming out of programs, uh, programs and uh, the persecution of, of Jews. I think Anna actually came from a somewhat similar uh, background, did she not? Yes, absolutely. Same part of the world. I don't know the details of it, but I did meet her father. Her father was an incredible guy. He came when he was 12 years old, alone on the boat to the United States, went to New York, worked with, you know, all members of his family were there already. He went into the clothing business, like so many Jewish families. And, but then he, he did well, he bought real estate. And then they moved out West when Anna got married and Larry and, and Anna wanted to live out West. But anyway, they both came from the same place and her father, of course, grew up there. Anna was born here, but uh, her father is from the, that same part of the pogroms and stuff. And he was very, uh, he made jokes about it all the time, as you will find uh, people who have been abused do. They, um, it's a way to, to li live through it. Mm -hmm. um, a big Thank you for that. And so uh, do you, do you wanna continue on then a little bit more? Um... Just give me a little bit more because what I wanted to say about Anna, you might not, you know the history that um, uh, Moshe and his wife were in, uh, got out of France and into the United Kingdom during the Second World War. And he had already taken martial arts when he was in physics school before that, before the war. And so he was into all the martial arts already. Then when he came to Israel, he continued that. What happened with Anna is she started out as a dancer. I told you, swing out, sing out Sweet Land in New York. She was a regular dancer. Then she moved, married Larry. They moved to the West Coast and she could have done anything. And she just started developing her own kinesthetic sense. And she taught a lot of children and teenagers as well as adults. But the thing that she started doing in her performing arts was regular performing art per se. Uh, but she started gathering people. Uh, the Watts workshop was a multiracial workshop. And she found a lot of Black Americans who joined the company. And there was a whole group from Watts. They did this performance. And then there was a whole development of the gay community in San Francisco. And they somebody found out about her and they started coming over to her studio. And so she kind of started gathering a wider population of people to work with. And then she met um, Fritz Perls, the head shrinkish, and she he loved her and she loved him. We had a few sessions as a group, as students with Fritz Perls, but she used that kind of therapy of getting to know yourself. And I was interested because I was doing a master's in dance therapy at the time, at the same time I was studying. So she's had, she went from that. Uh, multiracial gay communities to therapy. And then the mission got even bigger with multiracial, of course, but it got to be the earth and that whole Earth Day thing blossomed out of that. So you can see how she just opened her kinesthetic sense, which was personal as a dancer, and then just got bigger and bigger and bigger and fantastic. So I wanted to get that in. Just like Moshe, I don't think he planned to teach all over the United States and the world. He just was going on his merry way. So he got bigger and more well-known. 
So they, they just followed their nose, their kinesthetic sense, and their incredible sense of awareness in their own bodies. It seems like also this element of really empowering people uh, to, to feel what was within them. And Anna was what was in them, it, within them, I guess, in terms of expression, uh, but definitely coming from that felt sense that that was very similar as Moshe. And it makes you be curious, uh, you know, I mean, I know some of that was going on and other people as well at the time, but with their backgrounds, uh, you know, if, how much their, the, the challenges of um, their upbringing had made them want to help people connect back to the, to the felt sense inside. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. They were, and oh, the, and the other thing, I don't think you know, but you, you probably, maybe you do. She was an incredible comedian, incredible. She made a film that's on YouTube called Four in the Afternoon. And at that time, John Graham um, was, was her, one of her dance partners, as well as a guy called A.A. A. Leaf. They were both teaching there. John also was teaching at improvisation and choreography at San Francisco State College. But John and Anna were hilarious in this film. It's very funny. <laughs> so, That's you, and I think she got that from her, her wonderful, I just adored her father. Because with all that, you know, suffering in the family or possibly, I mean, I didn't hear all the worst stories, but um, that they had that sense of humor. I loved it. I, I learned a lot from both of them because of that, Moshe as well as um, Anna. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Well, normally you've taken us on quite a little journey here with uh, Anna, a tribute to Anna, of course, who died this past year. Moshe, of course, died in 1984, I believe. So he's been gone a while and he would have been, it looks like to me, maybe about 20 or 30 years uh, older than, um, than uh, Anna. I'm not quite sure about the age differential there, but they certainly studied or were interested in some um, shared, they had a lot of shared interests and, and who else they were hanging out with and studying with at the same time. Yeah. How has it influenced your life? Each of them, do you feel what's been the biggest, like if you had a takeaway for your life from each of them, what do you think it would be? The takeaway from knowing them, uh -huh. having that experience, wake up, mm -hmm. wake up. I mean, I know Mr. Gurdjieff was, there were some Mr. Gurdjieff studios at San Francisco, everything was happening there and I was aware of them. But because it was wake up through your body, there couldn't be anything more influential to our brains than movement. Mm -hmm. And your own movement, not something you made up. I, I, I think they were, that's my big takeaway. They, I, I woke up and it was also like finding a home. I wanted to wake up. I didn't know how. Mm, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Mm, Norma, thank you so much. Thank you so well, much. Am I, am I ending it too soon for you? Did you have more things that you needed to share with us? Oh, oh my I got everything on my list. I just, I know you, everyone out there appreciates them, but I couldn't help but say a few of the things that I, I loved about them. Yeah, absolutely. And there'll be, you know, people of all ages here are watching. And so some people are like, I, you know, those old people, I don't know, maybe don't know so much about them, but we'll, we'll be inspired to look up and understand a little bit more. I mean, there's so much out there on Anna and her beautiful work. Uh, now is a perfect time to, to look at her influence uh, on the arts. And of course, one of the things that we're talking about is embodied lifelong practice and talk about somebody who was able to practice through the length of her life. What, uh, how incredible, 
How incredible. It is incredible. It it absolutely completely incredible. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It is. So thank you so much, Norma, for being with us. I, I really appreciate you agreeing to do it and uh, sharing your unique experience with both of them. You're very welcome. Yeah. Okay, everybody. Thanks for joining us again uh, for bonus day. And if you haven't upgraded, I'll just say now is the time to consider upgrading before the summit is completely over. You've got just a little bit more time to upgrade at the reduced price. So grab it while you can. If you want to watch all these bonus sessions, all the sessions of the summit, get transcripts, get audios, and even do those bonus courses with some really fabulous teachers like Dr. Martha Eddy. Okay, thanks everybody. Norma and I are saying goodbye.